Okay, so thank you very much for uh, coming along. My name is Ian Moody. I'm a school councillor here. I've been here for just over a year, started in August, and been in Singapore for 13 years. Uh, next door at UWC for uh, the rest of the time. So I've had this experience at uh, Dover Court, and I came here because I come from a family of five kids. And I hate noise, you know, and uh, this place is much quieter and calmer. And it also fits my background because uh, when I was a student counsellor in Australia, I worked in a school where you had this diversity of background from kids with disabilities right through to IV students. And I much prefer working with that group than just straight academic students. And uh, it's much more of um, uh, it's my, uh, my thinking and uh, my background. I grew up in a very, very small town in the outback of Australia. Um, uh, I think there were more dogs and cats in the town than people. That's how small it was. So you can imagine coming to a big city and kind of uh, changed my thinking a lot. And that's why I very much crave the, the small environment to go back to, to relax. And I think when I finish work, I'll uh, end up in a place like that. It's, uh, it's much more uh, to my way of thinking. Anyway, welcome to Singapore. And uh, what you see on the screen behind me is uh, the iconic structure. It's probably well known. You may not know this. A friend of mine is the chief financial officer of that place, uh, Marine Bay Sands. And he told me uh, a few months ago, he said, you know what, it costs $5 billion to build that complex, and the guy made his money in four years. That's how much money's gone through that place. Yeah. And uh, so he's uh, kind of a little rich man. Not little, he's a very big rich man at the moment, but he runs a lot of casinos out of Las Vegas and so on. So that's, that's, it's quite a famous building and I'm sure you've seen it and probably visited uh, the uh, gardens by the bay. The bay uh, is quite famous too, so there's a lot of good places to, to see in Singapore. Okay, just a few facts about Singapore. I'm just going to zip through this so you've got an idea. The average temperature, I'm not sure that's accurate because uh, I know this for a fact. My brother came here last year and he said the uh, pilot got off the plane, he said, the temperature outside is 39 degrees, and the temperature recorded in the newspapers and this and that was 33. So I'm thinking, well, hang on, <laughs> there's a difference there. So, uh, and I'm sure you'll get, to, especially come from the UK, and uh, if you go back there in the winter time, uh, one of the things you'll notice is the uh, difference in temperature. Living here in Singapore for such a length of time, I went back to Australia in the summer break, but it's winter back there and it's three degrees. And I couldn't wait to get back here. And I'm sure our blood gets thinner when we are uh, here for a long time. So you feel the cold. So that's the first thing you notice, the temperature difference. Um, the land mass is a really interesting one. I saw a picture the other day from a satellite of Singapore 20 years ago and what it is now. And do you think it's the same size? No. Yeah. There's a lot of reclaimed land going on. In fact, I'd say it's about at least 10%, maybe 20% bigger. Um, because when they dig all the big holes for the uh, uh, apartments and so on, they've got to put it somewhere and they are building the ports uh, off that uh, land mass. So uh, it is getting bigger slightly. Uh, the language is there, you'll probably, um, I was talking to a taxi driver this morning and uh, he was laughing because he actually went to study in the same town I'm from, Adelaide in uh, Australia. And you know, you're like a Chinese person, you can speak really well with English. And uh, I said, yeah. And uh, so what, you know, and uh, understanding the multicultural nature of Singapore is really, really important part of it, I think. Um, the lightning capital of, uh, of the world is here. The, um, the number of lightning storms per uh, land mass area is the biggest in the world, so it's just something to be careful about. And uh, my daughter, when she was uh, here, she uh, went on a school trip once and they had lightning in the next door, I can say, this wasn't here. And uh, she, uh, to this day, is really scared of lightning because they were caught out uh, in a kayaking you know, expedition outside uh, on the sea. And uh, I was a little bit annoyed because it's really important to uh, protect the lightning. And, uh, you know, of course, you'd be really unlucky if you struck, but uh, safety is really important. So we do have lightning detectors around the school, so the kids are well trained, trained in uh, being uh, told Undercover, so uh, just keep that in mind. The lightning one uh, 
is quite a big issue. Uh, the good news is there's no typhoons, earthquakes, that sort of thing. Uh, I lived in Japan and had a big earthquake in 1995 in Kobe. It's about 30 kilometres and it's the most scary thing, I tell you. you know, when you're up in a high building, you've got no control over anything. So uh, if you're asking the good things about living in Singapore. Population, uh, uh, statistics there. A lot of um, expat people, um, almost a third of the population, and uh, that includes helpers, that includes construction workers, a lot of different people. Um, three quarters Chinese background, uh, of course, and uh, Malay, Indian, and, and the rest of us make up the uh, group. Seen the flag, you may not know what it all means, but um, uh, the red, uh, the white, the crescent moon, uh, the young nation on the right. We're just over 50 years old, Singapore. So uh, Lee Kuan Yew, who started, uh, is the real founder of this past away a few years ago, and um, he really um, had quite a vision about Singapore and still continues because his son is the uh, Prime Minister at the moment. And, uh, um, you know, it's, uh, it's really, it's probably one of the safest places I think in the world to, uh, to bring up kids. It's a very safe environment and uh, you've got to be careful because when they leave the country to study in other countries, it's not the same. And they have this sense of uh, everything's okay but uh, there's just something to be aware of. So bringing up children in Singapore is a fabulous environment. It's warm, it's hot, great travel opportunities. I'll, I'll talk about the positives in the um, you know, there are also some uh, downsides. Um, people, I don't know about your family, but my family think I'm going to join holiday in Singapore. But it's not easy because we are away from our, you know, our contacts, our family, especially with kids and stuff. Uh, it's, uh, it can be a little bit difficult at times. Uh, religion, uh, a lot of Buddhists, almost half. Um, so different. Um, Religions, uh, you notice this in Asia, it's uh, um, quite uh, a feature of their lifestyle. Some of these you may recognise. Have you seen some of those already? But, uh, there's a lot of Walker centres, the Food Republic concept is a shopping uh, place, but a lot of uh, very, very high end restaurants and also uh, all the centres you can get screened. Right in the middle on the right there, that's uh, from the top of one of the towers, uh, I think it's a hotel, Swiss hotel, I think. And um, yeah, fantastic views, but you want to make sure if you have a secret uh, rendezvous with your partner, etc., make sure there's no smog or fog or rain. Sometimes you have to take it to the charts and book it last minute, but um, most times it's fairly clear. Um, but I tend to prefer, I must have a fear of heights, I think, I much prefer just a um, flat area, one of my favourite areas is called Dempsey, uh, you may have heard of Dempsey, uh, and uh, I'm not here to advertise any particular restaurant there, but uh, they do serve some very nice food in that, in that region. Food is a very important part of Singapore, actually, uh, you see a huge range of foods, um, so, um, here are some of the ways of uh, Singapore. You hear this word la mentioned a lot. Now, no la, it's not a person. It's actually no. La. la is just an expression that put on the end of a lot of things, a lot of words. And um, you'll find um, uh, that happens quite, quite a lot. Customer service is something that frustrates me because I've lived in Japan, their service is everything. And sometimes you go into a shop and you want a particular size shirt for some outfit and they will point you and say, there it is over there. And you think, well, hang on, come over and show me and explain it, get it for me and I'll go and try it on and they, they won't do it. And uh, so service is something that your mind is quite challenging sometimes. Um, the other thing, I'll tie a couple of these things together. You'll see some t-shirts down in Chinatown that says Singapore is a fine city, you see those? And it's a fine for everything. Be very careful about, uh, and the history of it goes like this: the MRT, the train system, um, years ago, many, many years ago, uh, someone put some chewing gum on the door, and the door was shut, and it shut the whole train system down. And their response to that was to fine everyone for having chewing gum, everyone. 
and uh, so that's how they uh, respond, I suppose, pretty quickly. But um, it's uh, it, it works. I mean, this is the thing about Singapore: the infrastructure it works. And if you look at the way they build their buildings and where they build them, there's a rule or a, or a, a guideline that says that everyone has to be about no more than 400 metres from a bus stop or a train station for the transport situation. If you're driving a car, you'll see why that's such a good uh, place. If you ever run a group or are in a group of people, local people, and you ask them for their ideas, you probably won't get much of a response because they follow the rules absolutely to a T. And uh, as I said, it works, so why, why change? So uh, you find that a little bit frustrating perhaps. Um, public uh, discourse is, uh, we, you know, in Hong Kong at the moment it's just gone a little bit crazy there, hasn't it? So you probably won't see that here because they'll shut it down. No one's really allowed to get up and um, obviously um, abuse the government at all for good reason. But um, it's certainly um, um, what they call speakers' corner where people will be able to give their opinion, but it's a very controlled environment. And uh, they don't like uh, people uh, saying negative things, uh, again, for good reason, that's simple. Uh, a couple of contact numbers, hopefully you won't need those, but um, the ambulance in most countries would be triple zero, triple nine, but here it's nine nine five. So just um, Take note of that if you do that uh, service. Uh, I mentioned the fine for everything. Um, interesting enough, there's no welfare system here in Singapore because um, you're expected as a family to support the elderly people, and you will see a lot of uh, elderly people still out there doing fairly uh, mundane jobs like cleaning and uh, um, you know, taxi driving and that sort of thing because government support is not there for them, it's an expectation that uh, families look after uh, the elderly as well as uh, the young people. And having helpers and stuff goes a long way towards helping in that area too. Have you come across Durian? I'm just going, no, I'm not going to say any more. Set <laughs> uh, point to you or not. You, you will find it and you will smell it and uh, you'll say, how can people eat it? quite a delicacy, if you get past that, it is quite nice. I have not even got past that point, right? so uh, I have to admit, uh, it tell me it's nice, but uh, that's what it looks like on the top photo there. And you'll see it being sold probably $3 each, you know, it's quite an expensive fruit, it's quite large. A bit like a uh, small watermelon, I guess, but um, it, uh, it has a particular uh, quality that the local people love. And, um, Mango steam is the other one as well. Mosquitoes are a big thing because they really, really are hot on the dengue fever here and they'll uh, send inspectors into most apartments at various times. So if you're here for a couple of years, and that's a guarantee that you'll have a knock on the door. And what they're looking for is breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Um, for example, the flower pot, if you've got a water catchment area, a pot underneath, that's an absolute no-no, so um, because it stores water, obviously. And um, if you've got an animal, like a cat or a dog, make sure you change the water every couple of days because having still water in your house, you get a fine pretty quickly for that. So um, just bear that in mind. But, um, it's, it's all designed to prevent the dengue fever from um, getting out of control. Um, probably an Asian thing, no, she's at home, so go and visit someone. And that's probably going to be quite rare, actually, to be invited in someone's house. Um, take your shoes off as a matter of courtesy. Uh, that's, uh, that's quite uh, traditional in most Asian homes, I think. Um, yeah, I mentioned about this. Uh, it's very rare for Singaporean people to engage in a conversation, really, uh, in a group. They, uh, they don't like to ask too many questions. For example, uh, where are you from? Uh, how do you like Singapore, you'll get that. Taxi drivers are quite good now for that because it's their business, obviously, but uh, local people will go about their business and focus on what's going on in their lives, more so than uh, yeah, other people. Uh, some of the um, good things, it's no tipping. I don't know if you've ever lived in or been to America, but you know, you always got to allow a bit more. And there's good reason for that over there because they don't pay them much money in terms of salary for the, the workers. 
and in other countries they pay them quite well. And uh, I'm quite so envious, I suppose, of my daughter. She gets uh, on a weekend forty-four dollars an hour to work in the shop. And I'm thinking, gosh, <laughs> I'm in the job. But uh, you know, and here I can get ten. So uh, she uh, instead of coming back to visit us, she stays there at work and earns money for her uh, the university studies. So uh, it does vary enormously. Um, and uh, they don't tip back there, but they certainly uh, don't tend to tip here, which is uh, a bit surprising. Sometimes people do, but most times not expected. Um, yeah, children, and this is, uh, I don't know whether I look older than what I am, but you know, in the MRT, there are special seats for the older people. Maybe I get on with a punch back or something. I don't know, but the number of young kids that stand up for me is quite amazing. So if you want to test it out, just stare down these young ones who sit in those seats, and I guarantee they'll, they'll stand up for you. And uh, it's, it's quite uh, respectful or differential, as you call it, um, policy that the young ones seem to have here, which is quite nice. Not so outgoing, not so adventurous, though, very traditional. Um, so I don't think you'll find them uh, finding Mount Everest or anything like that in a hurry. Um, the apartment stuff is quite interesting because when we first came here 13 years ago, I didn't know this rule existed, but it did. You could buy an apartment for 10% deposit and then uh, not have to pay for it for two years while they built it. And nearby to us was a place going up, and this guy said to me, oh, you can have this place for 1.8 million penthouse apartment. But I had 180,000 at the time. And I was watching it, and three months later it got sold for 2.4 million, and three months later 2.9. So if I was smart, I knew the rules, I could have earned a million dollars in six months. Not a bad investment, eh? But that, those days are finished, so I shouldn't have told you that because everyone's probably rubbing their hands with glue. I'm going to do that. Uh, apartments these days for foreigners are uh, they put a lot of pooling measures out, out there. and. Uh, that's one of the big expenses, I guess, is uh, living in, in Singapore can be expensive living in apartments. Buying an apartment, uh, uh, unless you're going to be here for a long term, probably may not be such a good idea, but uh, uh, the prices are getting uh, quite uh, extreme, really. Just an example, we had a big house in Australia, we sold that bought an apartment, and we just sold the apartment, and uh, uh, it went up probably double what the place in Australia is. Uh, since gone up, so uh, you know those days are kind of uh, at the moment. Uh, young ones tend to live at home uh, if they can't buy an apartment until they're at least 35. That's part of the rules in town, and often you'll see uh, a whole generation living together. Um, and um, sometimes it's quite crowded. Like in uh, it used to be the housing development board, the big apartments, the 40-storey. Um, government housing places, sometimes you'll see big families in three bedroom apartments or even less. Um, I think uh, the most interesting I saw was a family of six kids in a one bedroom apartment. You think, now, how can they fit? This is where do IKEA come in. They have two double beds, two bunk beds, sorry, in a bedroom and two mattresses on the floor. There's the six kids and the parents have to sleep in the lounge. I'm thinking there's something wrong there, isn't it? So uh, it was so proud of it. Uh, they were happy, you know. Um, just a few things about the locals. Um, they often have a, they're fairly busy, they often have a couple of eggs going at the same time, so um, um, they won't uh, seem to stay very late because they've got other commitments going on. So don't be offended if you invite them around and they uh, start looking at their watch about 9 o'clock, so you've got, got to go. So uh, just uh, be aware of that. Um, Kiasu is a very interesting word. Does anyone know what it means? Kiasu? You've probably get experienced it. You know if you're in a taxi or a car and you want to change lanes and get in and the car on the side will speed up to block you off almost? That's called Kiasu, but they have to be in front and be number one. And uh, even in the line, you know, if you're lining up and uh, you're waiting patiently, suddenly someone in front of you and uh, they want to get there first, getting on the MRT train. Right. Stand back for the rush. <laughs> first in best dress policy, I think, always 
listening to me, that's, that's chaos getting there first. And uh, if you go around to someone's place and are giving a gift, uh, no clocks and no knives. Clocks, look out what's going on. It's to do with time, obviously. It's almost superstitious where you know your time is limited. Don't give them a clock because they start watching. Pass away, you know. It's almost like a bad omen. I can pass away, you know, short of the time that I should. Right? And knives uh, means cutting off your life, basically. So, uh, don't get it a knife or a clock. You know, you'll hear this term auntie and uncle rock right? because uh, like older people get called that. Um, and that's just a term of respect. And auntie, uh, sometimes a cleaning person, you'll hear, oh, auntie, can you come in? And it's just a, a general name for someone. Um, how many of you got cars or thinking about cars? One, yeah. When you got a uh, couple, when you've got kids, it's probably important. But this thing called the COE is called the Certificate of Entitlement. It's like a tax. Before you even start thinking about a car, I forget what it is at the moment. It was got as high as eighty thousand uh, dollars. Forty. Yeah, about forty. When I first came here, it was only eight, so it's quite feasible for sort of getting that point. And of course, there's grab car and Gojek and taxis, and there are a lot of taxi fares in, uh, in that price. So uh, if you do the figures, you work out what's um, economic. If you're doing lots of trips with the kids and so on, well, um, you can't know, be um, Chinese New Year, see a lot of the red packets, which are like uh, the kids get a lot of money, and they'll come and use the red packets. So, uh, if you make friends with the locals and uh, around Chinese New Year, you might have to get a few uh, red packets. Uh, they're not expecting hundreds of dollars, usually five, ten dollars, and uh, you know, the kids collect it. It's, uh, it's quite uh, something to look forward to for them. There are some books, uh, as I said, I'll keep these slides for you on the school website, so you know, there's some books around that you can have a look if you're interested in that. Um, they do push their children quite. Harshly, I'd say harshly, and the young ones because there's a lot of competition and it to Kiasu again. Um, and um, getting into the NUS, National University, is quite competitive and very, very demanding. So uh, if you've made it into there, you've made it literally. But now they're starting to think overseas, the local students here, so it sort of spreads the, the pressure a bit. But um, for your children, probably they're later on going. Back home is the university of choice, but um, you will see a lot of students um, up late at night study. It's quite important uh, to them, and uh, it's again related to getting ahead. Okay, now I'll get into the, um, the general stuff about moving from country to country. Um, I always start with the positives, and this is not a complete list by any uh, stretch of the imagination. So. Uh, one of the, some of the good things about moving is that you get to meet new people, of course, that you uh, uh, have the opportunity to travel and meet friends from all around the world. And this is the long-term perspective of it all, I think. If you meet people from around the world, uh, it's very easy to go and stay with them. You always enjoy a country and a town or a city better if you know someone in that town or city. Right? So making friends from around the world, I think, is a really good idea because eventually uh, you will to catch up at various times and uh, you make lifelong friends. It's really, really important, I think. And I think uh, for people that stay at home, it's the key to enjoying Singapore, is to make contact with different organisations and friend build friendships through that. I'll talk about that a bit uh, later as well. Um, the obvious stuff about uh, food uh, and cultural experiences. Uh, Singapore is a very, very... Uh, flushed with opportunities in that area. Uh, learning a new language, I don't know how brave you are, but uh, learning uh, some of the new languages, yeah, it doesn't have to be the local one, it can be, uh, I'm trying to learn French, I'm doing a shocking job of it, but uh, <laughs> I'm getting there. And Japanese, what's interesting, when I go to France, because I stayed so long in, uh, well, a short time really in Japan, but Japanese cuts over the top of it. Last uh, summer I was in uh, our place in France, I go to the local uh, bakery and uh, I'm saying, uh, it's just 
a very extreme place. I hadn't seen him for a long time in Japanese. And the lady's French. And he, this guy's a bit strange, you know. And it took me about two minutes of talking in Japanese because I realised I'm not in Japan. But my brain was sort of thinking like foreign country, speak Japanese and uh, learning French. And then I started speaking French. So I kept putting in some English words and Japanese words in the sentence. So uh, I'm probably the worst person to say this, but uh, learning a language is one of the biggest challenges and I take my hat off to the kids can learn languages here. It's a, it's a great opportunity for them. Talk about a different perspective on life, and I think this is really important. When you live in a different country, you get a really good understanding about how hard it is for kids who don't speak English to come here and study. Uh, you try living in Japan where they don't speak English at all, in the town that I was in, and then you think, gee, it's hard. And um, when the kids come here, from China or wherever, to learn English in an English-speaking curriculum, really, really tough. And uh, you, you form a, a different form of admiration for them. So I guess when you go back home and you come across uh, people like that, I think you probably naturally feel a little bit of empathy for them. Because it's not easy, I think, to live in a culture different to, to your own. Um, I think one of the, the good things, and you won't get this until you're, you all leave Singapore or kids leave to go to university or whatever down the track. What's really important is that they will have in their hearts and their minds this experience. And I don't think it ever leaves anyone. And I'll give you this example. Our kids um, went next door and service was a big part. Community service, going into the community, helping locals, going into the region, helping the disadvantaged. What our son, our son is a dentist now, what he does every year, we can tell him to do this, he gets a group of his university friends and goes to Cambo Cambodia and does free dental work for a couple of weeks. Right? So that's the giving back part of it. And that would not happen if he was in Australia studying, and only in Australia I could do that. Right? So living in this environment is a really good chance to see, yeah, there are good opportunities for us, have a look at what's going on in the community if you can give back in any way, shape or form. You've all got special talents, I'm sure. That can make you feel good, it can make the adjustment to this place much, much easier, I think. These are the challenges. So, uh, I think one of the things you'll notice if you're new to Singapore or new to the school for that matter, is an emotional roller coaster that goes on. One minute we'll be really happy, the next minute we'll miss something from a previous life. And that's very normal. We call it grief, because with grief we've lost something, and in this case we've lost something like maybe your favourite food from back home, maybe it's your favourite shop, best friend, mother, father, whatever. You know, something has changed in your life. And when you understand that, that's a very normal reaction. Grief comes in different forms. You know, if you imagine if someone's passed away, some people feel okay for a while, and then suddenly it hits them. And they get really sad, and start crying, and get upset, and angry, all that sort of stuff. Well, it's the same sort of thing. Probably not the same level as uh, losing someone special like that, but it's a response to grief that's really, really significant in the mood. Um, identity, there are three things I should say. Grief is one. Two is identity. Identity is who you are as a person. And the way I put it like this to the students is, what is your thing? What is, if I ask any kids of your age, what are you famous for? What would they say? Are you the maths champion? Are you the football champion? Are you the netball superstar? What are you? Because I think the job of schools, and for us as parents, I think, is to make sure that every student, every one of our kids, knows what they're good at. We only just one thing, we several things. It has to be something. And that's the purpose that keeps them going through the school in life generally. I mean, if you think about your own life, if people recognise you for being a, a nice person, well that's good. But if you are recognised for being someone who gets in when, uh, when someone needs some help very quickly and you're a very understanding and kind person, well that, that's your thing. Right? If you're well known as a football player out there and people recognise you for that purpose, well, 
that makes you feel good too. So it's really important, that's what we call identity, to recognise what, what you're good at. Some of these um, issues come up for uh, other students because it, it goes under the heading of what I call a sense of belonging. You know, do you feel like you fit in to here? And of course there are cultural differences that go on, but uh, you know, do you feel like you fit in? And this school is very, very good from that point of view, helping kids simulate and, uh, and fit in. I think uh, I was just reading before I came here a list of all the comments that a lot of parents have made of new, from new students who have just enrolled. And it was very, very common to hear, yeah, we felt like this was home almost, that sort of comment, right? which is a good, a good aspect of the school. It's quite unique actually because in other schools that are very academic, that's all the facts of the results. Results, results, results. Here it's a community, a true community, and that's, uh, um, and that's not just me speaking in uh, a corporate spin, if you like, but it's what I've experienced and what I enjoy being in. Relationships are really important, because I think relationships are the key to everything, actually. Students, young ones, you guys, it's all about forming positive working relationships, effective relationships, because um, that's what... Um, it's quite uh, positive. So, there's a bit of theory here and this is what happens. Um, if you look at the country of origin where you come from, that's the first part of the graph on the left, as you move through in time, you will uh, get what we call the honeymoon period, which is what you're in now. Everything's exciting you. It usually lasts two or three months. And then suddenly there will be a dip into what we call a disorientation, number four, disorientation phase, which uh, means you suddenly miss things, you miss things about home. You're thinking about going back a little bit more frequently than what you normally would have thought. And uh, that's, that's a period of uh, normality. It happens with all of us. That suddenly you think, oh, well, maybe this is not such a good move. And as parents, we start to worry a bit. Now, in our case, we came, my wife left a really good job uh, in Australia to come here, so I started the worst guy in the planet. I was happy, great job, fantastic, enjoyed it. Kids are a bit unsettled. Why were they unsettled? Because my wife is unsettled. Right? There's an old saying out there that goes, happy wife, happy life. And I'll tell you what, it's true. So I had to do a lot of things to make sure she was happy. The trick to it is this, I'll tell you now, she's not here, so I can say anything I like, but uh, she's still here in Singapore, but not uh, here today. Room. The thing that made the difference, she got involved with a really good friend who together they started raising money to build houses in Cambodia. And every year for four years they were doing this project, getting a group of women together to build houses. They raised $100,000 each year for four years. Amazing. So they both had skills to do that and that was the difference. They felt a sense of belonging and identity, all of that sort of stuff made a big difference. So with her, it was about connecting with a group of people like-minded. And um, she didn't have a job. She eventually um, did get a job and um, after three or four years worked in Singapore and was still was working. So it, it changed everything. And she was ready to leave Singapore after six months. She said, I don't like this place, I'm ready to go. And we bought a house in Australia near the school where the kids went to and all that sort of stuff. And then a month later she changed her mind. She said, here we go, we've got this house. We never lived in the place, we've sold, sold it since. But these things happen, you know. So I've learned the hard way, I guess. So you get this recovery adjustment period too, and that's where we went through after about six to twelve months, I think. And you notice the level though, it's a bit less than the country of origin level. So these levels are just how you feel, I guess, about uh, life generally. So you can see that uh, it drops a bit, and then if you move again, you go through another dip, and you never ever get back to the original level that you left home. Right? That's just part of the transition process. And when I first started this job in store as a counsellor, I had this girl that was always crying. She came to me and said, oh, I was crying, I wake up in the middle of the night, crying. No, it took me a long time to work out what it was. She'd moved 11 times in four years. Right? So each time the dip was going down and down, the grief was not resolved, 
and that's why she was crying. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really important to understand that you go through this honeymoon period and then there's a dip and you need to pick up on that, that dip. And the dip is that they'll suddenly not sleep well at night, they'll sometimes cry a little bit more than normal, maybe they don't want to come to school, but certainly uh, just talk to them about what do they miss from home, but don't say to them, yeah, we're going back next month, we're going to stay there for another week or whatever. It's about moving through the process and looking for opportunities here at school and in the community to help the, the kids assimilate. And it's usually about friends, making sure that they have a good circle of friends around them. And that okay. Just, uh, I'm going to sit through this pretty uh, quickly because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, I think what's really important uh, about coming here is understanding uh, this integration process. So ethnocentric people tend to think, oh, well, I've left this country, it's the best place on the planet, and uh, I'm just going to stay here a couple of years and I'll be fine. It's almost like a denial of experiencing the different culture that you have here. And you can, people get very defensive and they uh, are almost flippant about the whole culture that they're in, so it's quite important. And ethno-relative is just the opposite, full-on acceptance. This is a great experience, it's valuable, it's worthwhile, it's great for my kids, great for my family, and so on. That's true integration. So getting curious about um, the new experience that you're having here is, is really important, the culture, the environment. So, a few little tips to uh, finish up. I think it's important to uh, to consider when you're settling in, make this a home and a haven. It's your place. And uh, it's really important to develop, not lose your old past traditions and rituals, but develop new ones. And it's just transformed. For example, Christmas time, a lot of people do go back home, but a lot of people stay here. So have your normal Christmas celebration, but of course you can integrate with the local food a little bit more perhaps, so you are starting to integrate more and more through that process. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, my situation, uh, helping your family uh, develop connections with different organisations in town, is the School Parent Association here. ANZA is a, is a group of people, Australia and New Zealand, we, you know, I think people from outside can also play sport, we do a lot of sporting uh, activities. So it's pretty, uh, pretty strong groups like that. Friends of the museum run really good trips to different parts of the world to look at uh, uh, different, uh, uh, obviously, museum-related uh, uh, places. And obviously, uh, church groups and so on, special interest groups exist as well. The other thing is the holiday stuff, because what's quite different is that your holidays in your country are probably different here, like the National Day, uh, Australia, we have the Melbourne Cup, horse racing some reason they have a holiday on that day. We don't have it here. But I guarantee every Australian over here will be listening to the thing, stopping. It's what they call uh, the race that stops a nation, literally. It's not just a nation, it's probably around the world. And um, it's quite a big event to us. Uh, but don't mention the cricket, for heaven's sake, don't mention the cricket. <laughs> that is a no no at the moment. But we'll get there. Okay. So just the uh, last little bit there. I think it is important to acknowledge what you're going through. There is some grief uh, and sadness and loneliness associated with this move. Try to stay positive though and uh, be a positive role model because your children will pick up from you how you feel very quickly. And uh, it's okay to talk to them and say, yeah, mummy feels a little bit sad or daddy uh, is a bit lost here or I had a great job before and I'm just trying to work out what I'm going to do here. Keep talking, keep communicating with your family and um, I say when you go back for the first time to visit um, back home, um, I say the uh, conversation about Singapore usually disappears after about five minutes. They're really interested to start with, and then because they've got no knowledge of what it's like. And as I said at the start, I think we're on one giant holiday, some people, but uh, there are family members and people in your probably uh, circle of friends, etc., that have been on this journey too. So 
when you do go back, you probably associate more with them than other people who have never been outside of your home country. That's uh, what tends to happen. And your kids also, when they go to university, will probably associate more closely with kids who have also been with All right. I just put the, uh, probably not this already. And I'll include a list of resources uh, to a good friend of mine, Suzanne. Uh, she runs an outside uh, counselling service, so there uh, and I put this whole thing together. So acknowledge the work she's done. Okay, that is my contact. If you uh, want to make contact with me, uh, you know, I do encourage parents to make direct contact. Uh, Always go through your teacher though first, your child's teacher, because uh, they see your child more during the day than what I do, of course. But if it continues you know, for months on end and you don't see the um, respite in terms of their reaction and uh, that sort of thing, well, uh, by all means, make contact. 